Um, I am Greta Lindsay, and I am the interim director of statistical consulting and research services. Um, and I'm also the senior project manager for the human ecology learning and problem solving lab, which is a social science data collection and research facility on campus. Um, I came back to MSU in 2016. Um, from, um, so I got my master's degrees in mathematics and statistics in 2006 and 2008. Uh, then I left to go work for a local software company. Um, and I did a lot of um, quality control and statistical analysis. Um, and at that company, we used um, Python 2 a lot. And since I came back to MSU in 2016, towards the end of that time, they were switching over from Python 2 to Python 3. So there is some slight differences between Python 2 and Python 3. Um, I primarily use R, but I still have that Python knowledge. Um, I had to learn Python um, uh, on the fly by basically teaching myself. And on top of that, it wasn't really like Python, Python. It was Python that was accessed through a particular software package. So it's a little bit different. Um, and so I'm hoping that we can at least give you the basics of what you need in order to get started today. Uh, it's only going to be the very, very briefest touch on a lot of things, but it, hopefully it's enough to help you um, again, get a good start so that you're not starting um, from scratch like I was. Uh, I did have, I did take some computer science classes in my undergraduate degree, um, but then when I got to C++ and I got a C plus, I was like, I don't need that degree. <laughs> so, um, and then actually what really knocked me out of a CS minor was um, data structures, which is kind of strange because Python is great with data structures. Uh, anyway, um, as a statistician, um, it's good to be able to use lots of different languages to solve different problems. I personally think that R is better for actual statistical analysis, but Python is great for data wrangling and database management, as well as it's just a really good skill to know. Um, this is the um, pilot of our Introduction to Python workshop. And so it might be a little bit rough. We might change how we do things the next time we teach this. Uh, we will give you the opportunity for a feedback survey at the end of it. We would really appreciate constructive feedback to help us revise this. The other thing that we're doing is we're doing this a little bit different. Um, we're not teaching this through um, Anaconda or a Jupyter notebook. Um, if you are sort of familiar with Python, you might have heard of those. Those are just different user interfaces. We're teaching this through R Studio, um, not just to show you that R Studio is more than for more than just R, but to have a nice consistent framework. And the hope is that um, you'll be able to do some work in Python, and then again, you know, use R Studio to do more sophisticated visualizations and statistical analysis using R, and kind of go back and forth. Um, and it might turn out that we decide that this doesn't work the best to teaching it in this framework, um, but we wanted to try to give it a, a shot. So, uh, when you installed R, well, so first of all, oh, Sally, um, there are, um, Sally is a research statistician for scissors, and so she is also available to help, and she's recently gone through the installation process on a Mac. So, if you've got a Mac, she could maybe answer some of your questions, um, but she is also a Python newbie. So I'm trying to get my scissors team to at least get started on that. Um, so uh, in order to get started today, there were a few things that you needed to do. First, you needed to download R, the language, um, and that is just, just to get um, uh, the connection to Python. That's all we're gonna be um, basically using for R. Um, and then our studio is this user interface. And uh, then from this, we will use our studio and R to download the rest of what we need for Python. Uh, this document here, um, if you unzipped the uh, folder or the folder that you were given, hopefully you unzipped it and saved it in a location where you can save to. Otherwise, later we'll get an error. Um, can yes. you raise your hand if you didn't get the email from after you registered and you don't have a phone and you need for the zip folder and the installation video? 
Okay, see, thank you. Okay. Um, so in that in that zip folder, there's a bunch of images, and that's just so that we can get this document to compile. There's a PDF um, copy of what I'm going to go over today, uh, and then there's a file called RMD, and that is what this document is. It is a, um, a mixture of code and documentation. Uh, if you code in Python or in R or any other language, you really want to push reproducible research. And so being able to have your code along with your documentation and have them linked together so that you're minimizing copying and pasting, um, that will make your life easier, make your research reproducible, and you'd be able to hand off your codes to somebody else and they'd be able to go through it. So we'll, um, if you're um, still in the process of installing and getting caught up, we're just going to give a little bit of background information. I will go over the installation process a little bit. So, um, and uh, this is, some of this code is written in R, and it's just so that when we compile this document into a nice little pretty PDF it, or a Word document, it'll look nice. Um, so don't worry too much about some of the code chunks that you might see right now. Uh, so, Python R and R Studio. Briefly, um, Python is a popular programming language, um, commonly used for statistical analysis, data visualization, machine learning. There's lots of different ways to interact with Python um, through different integrated development environments or IDEs. Um, the choice of the IDE that you might use depends on your context, nature of the project, personal preference who you're working with, what they use, how you want to collaborate. Um, some other examples other than RStudio are Idle, um, PyCharm, Jupyter Notebook. I've personally used Jupyter Notebook, um, Visual Studio Code. I haven't used Visual Studio for Python, um, uh, Google Colab, and RStudio. So I've um, uh, Anaconda or Spider are two other versions that are um, that basically big packages that I've used in the past. So Python has broad applications beyond data analysis. It can use it for web development, automation, and um, ultimately your choice between if you use R or Python will depend on your needs and preferences. Again, since we're, um, we developed these series of workshops using RStudio and um, our studio uses R behind the scenes. You do need to have both of them installed on your computer. And um, if we just if you decide to use our studio as your ID of choice, um, hopefully you can will continue and learn R as well. Um, any code chunk that is in here um, that's in a Python code chunk will work in any Python IDE. So you can just copy it and paste it or type it in in a different Python environment. So if you don't have RStudio installed, but you do have another, another Python IDE, feel free to use that, um, but I'm going to be using this one. Okay, so there is an installation demo for R workshops. I created one for Python. It's a half an hour. That is with having some of the installation time cut out. So I really, um, Plan, or I really want you to plan on at least 40 minutes to get things installed. You mentioned that record. This, is being this is being recorded. So if you do not have everything installed and you're playing catch up, pay attention up here. The video, this workshop is being recorded. Um, it'll take a week or so to get up. Um, Sarah, sometimes it takes a little bit longer, but she's going to work really hard to get this one up sooner. Um, so you might have to then go back and rewatch some of the beginning stuff or just rewatch the whole thing and it will hopefully make more sense as you follow along. Uh, the links to install R are up here and you can install Python. Um, I was going to have people install Python separately, but I'm going to work through um, using actually this code to install it. Uh, can't use this on a Chromebook hard to code on a Chromebook unless you're coding in Google's environment, which I haven't done. Um, Chromebooks just don't run this kind of software or have the power that you need. So steps to get ready. Hopefully um, some of these are done. If not, again, catch it up. You need RStudio or R, then RStudio. Download the zip file. Unzip the zip file. <laughs> 
Um, I have this emphasized here because again, if you you can access things from in a zip file, but if it's not unzipped, you can't save to it and it causes problems. Once you open our studio, it will probably look something like this. Uh, if then we'll go to file, open file, and then you would browse to the RMD file and you would open that up. And then as soon as you open it, now you should have four panes. And um, the reason why we have this zipped is that if we have code here that has a, a PNG, it'll give you a little preview in this um, uh, script window. Okay. All right. Uh, if we've got that up, um, if you did not have, next thing we need to do is get reticulate installed. Um, if you open this up and you saw a yellow bar at the top and it said install reticulate now, hopefully you went ahead and did that. Um, if you did not see that, we'll come over here to the lower right hand pane uh, where we'll see files, plots, packages, etc. If we click, click on packages, this is just for our packages, unfortunately, um, but we can type, start typing in reticulate and then it'll auto complete and then we would install that. And I'm not going to, it won't take that long to install, but I'm not going to do it right now. Um, that's the next thing that we need. All right, so quick check in. How are we feeling? Good. Okay. Anybody have any immediate problems? All right. So our studio orientation and layout. Um, a lot of this is really adaptable. If you've got multiple, mon uh, if you've got a nice big monitor, you can actually make three um, panels uh, instead of just two. You can rearrange things and move things around. Uh, we don't have a nice big um, screen here. So we just have two things and we're zoomed in. Um, you can zoom in by doing control plus. You can zoom out by doing control minus or command plus command minus. Uh, you can adjust your settings so you can go to tool, global options, change your appearance. Uh, if you need uh, a black background to make things more readable, you can change that. Uh, I, um, under the code, have, um, let's see, display. I have um, rainbow lines for tabs. Um, I also have uh, rainbow parentheses, um, normally have rainbow parentheses selected. So all of that will help with making sure, oops, and I don't want to, actually I want to go back to my appearance. And um, I can't remember what the normal one is. I'll just go with this one. All right. So you can play around with your appearance. Uh, this will be the code window or the, the script window, the editor. Console down here is where we'll get, uh, we'll, we can sometimes see uh, commands and the output of commands. Um, there is terminal and background jobs. Uh, we probably won't touch on those, but those are also down there. Environment was where we're going to store, we'll see variables and then we'll see them stored. Um, there's other things up here. And um, some of these will apply and some of them won't apply to Python. Uh, so files, plots, packages, and so on. All right. So now we have Reticulate installed. The next thing that we would do is install Miniconda. So by running this line of code, notice this is an R code because it's um, using R to make the connection with Python. Um, so you can either run commands uh, a line at a time by just doing control enter anywhere on that line, as long as you don't have anything highlighted. Um, you can run the entire code chunk by pressing the play button. So this is going to do three things. It's going to install Miniconda, which uh, includes the Python, just, um, language. 
it then um, when we have the double colon here, it uses reticulate without installing it or without loading it. Then we'll load reticulate. If you try to load the entire reticulate package without having mini conda installed, it'll give you an error. Then we're going to use today. We're going to use four Python packages, and uh, we'll use pandas, scipy, numpy, and matplotlib. And um, these all take a little bit of time. Uh, numpy comes with miniconda. This is just gets the latest version of it. Uh, and if um, you had all of this done beforehand, um, then it just saves some time during the workshop. But if not, you can work on installing these as we go. All right. Uh, Python, uh, or we do sometimes need to tell our studio where Python is at. So back in this tools, global options, if we click on Python, uh, we would, if we don't have a Python interpreter selected, we would go to select. And I don't have Python on my system. I have a Conda environment. So if I click on Conda environments, it takes a few seconds. It should come up. Um, there's one there. So um, let me actually run my library. So command enter, control enter for library reticulate. This is just loading that packet um, package. Let's see if that brought up Python. And um, now, because we loaded Reticulate, we can see our Conda environments. I'm using the latest version, uh, 3.11.4, um, and the older version is there. If for some reason you needed to use an older version, you could, um, but it's better to use the newer version if possible. I'm going to cancel that because I already have one selected, and I'm going to cancel again. Yes. Does it matter if the interpreter is in a, is in a bin? Uh, no. Um, as long as it sees that, um, as long as that bin contains the executable file, you should be okay. All right. Any other questions? Good question. All right. I'm not going to run this install line because that will take a while. Um, so this just talks about what I just did. So now let's talk about working in our studio. Uh, you'll notice that sometimes there is um, some lines of code that have lots of back ticks. Uh, and that is just so that when we print the PDF, you'll actually see what the code chunks look like in um, the console or in the, the script. Um, if we were to actually run them, we'll take all of some of the extra back ticks off. So what we'll want to do is in this um, file, if we want to see what it looks like, I'm going to take off the four back ticks above and below, and I'm going to remove these extra um, back tick R quote quote back tick, and now. Um, I get what looks like a code, we'll call this a code chunk. It's in gray background. We see a play button. We know that we can run this. So if we were to run this in, it's going to use the language R. And so we'll just hit play. And one plus one is two. The one in the square brackets, <laughs> the one in the square brackets just indicates it's the first line of the output. Uh, we can do the same thing with Python. So let's get rid of some of the, the um, four extra back ticks above and below and get rid of telling it what styling to use. Again, now we're using the Python language. We want to do one plus one. Let's see what happens when we do that. And it's going to now switch to the Python environment. So it takes a little bit to get going. Um, it calls reticulate to load Python. We get the Python version. Now, before we saw 
in the console, we saw one caret and a one plus one and then a two. Uh, when we're in Python, we see three carrots, one plus one and a two. We don't see the one um, in square brackets because it's um, Python doesn't let you know what line of output it is. Okay. Uh, when we are doing reproducible coding, we want to make sure that all of our code is in a code chunk so that it will be executable. Um, our studio also has spell checking built in. Um, it will uh, red squiggly line underneath words that it thinks that are misspelled. You can go to edit, um, check spelling, and check all the spelling. Um, sometimes if it is if it can identify a possible word in a dictionary, you can click on it and it'll suggest a word. And so if you find any words that are misspelled, feel free to fix them in this document. Uh, our studio will recognize where a variable lives. It will recognize if it is a variable in R or if it's a variable in Python. So over in the environment window, we see that we Python here and we have data, we have R, it's an R interface object. Um, we can switch to R environment and we could see if we had any variables that were stored in R. Um, and then we can go back and forth between R and Python. All right, so um, we don't need to run this again. Um, I meant to delete that, sorry about that. So what, um, we can use R to do code uh, without using Python. Uh, here we're using R the language. So let's just so, um, store the value of two in X, the value of three in Y, and then we'll do Z is X plus Y. And I'm just going to play the whole chunk. And notice that X, Y, and Z are stored in R. Normally when we're talking, um, when we're coding in R, we use a different assignment than an equal sign, but um, to because this is Python and we use equals in Python, we're using equals here. If we were to do the same thing in Python, again, we just take the R in the curly braces, return, uh, replace it with Python, and we can run the same code, but now those objects are stored in the Python interface. So if we were to change these values, let's say let's replace X with seven, and y with um, one and run this again. In Python, the values update seven, one, and seven plus one is eight. If we go back to R, they don't change. We're only changing the Python environment. All right, so now we're gonna switch. We're just going to use Python from here on out, okay? So in, um, we can use Python as a calculator. Um, probably not the best use of Python, but you could use Python as a calculator. Most of the time you're gonna be calculating things as you go um, uh, along the way. But just so that you, we can um, establish the operators for doing arithmetic in Python, plus symbol um, works as we expect. One plus two is three. For multiplication, we use the asterisk. 16 times nine is 144. Division is the forward slash. So 20 divided by five is four. Notice that it is 4.0. So it is not an integer. It's doing a decimal value there or a double. Um, subtraction is just the dash. Um, let's see what happens when we run two to the power of two. Is that the right answer? No. Okay. That's because in Python, it to erase something to an exponent, you don't use the caret. This is actually doing modulo instead of um, powers. 
So uh, to get a power, we do a double star or a double asterisk. So two double asterisk two is four. Um, we can put lots of spaces around our code to make things more readable. Python does not care about um, spaces. And so spaces are more for the human eye. And like R, Python has a wide range of libraries, um, often called modules uh, to do data analysis. Um, again, we're going to briefly touch on uh, pandas, NumPy, SciPy, and Matplotlib today, but there's many more than that. Um, we've already installed Reticulate. Um, this is uh, going through how we could get another package if we wanted something other than the ones that we already installed. You use um, library reticulate. Um, this is R code, so it's passing things um, in the R function way. Um, pi underscore install is the function, and then we put the package that we want in quotes. We already did this, so we don't need to do it again. Then once we have the package installed, we need to import it. So in R, we would use the library function to import a package. In Python, we use the import function. And the nice thing about Python is that you can give packages aliases because every time you use a function out of a particular package, you have to give it the package name. So in R, once you load a library, you have access to all the functions within that package and you only need to give it the package name if there might be some conflicts and you have to specify a particular version of how to calculate a mean um, if multiple packages have different definitions of that. In Python, you always have to use the package name. So um, if we give it an alias and it's a shorter name, then it just makes typing a lot easier. So here we're going to import pandas as um, PD. So it's just two letter abbreviation for pandas. So everybody go ahead and do this one. So command enter, control enter. And um, of course you're gonna tell me that we don't have pandas. And Hopefully all of you had it and it's just bothering or being problematic for me. And this will just take another minute. All right, so <laughs> it didn't take that long to install, just install pandas. As anybody, um, sounds like there's a few other issues going on. Uh, anybody else have particular? Okay. Anybody else having any other issues? Okay. So if we have to get them one at a time, hopefully that they're all as quick as pandas. Um, so once we have, we've run the pi install, now we're going to import pandas as pd. This should work now. All right. Um, we don't really see anything other than we get the three carrots back, um, but we can we'll test it out to make sure that we've got it in properly. 
Uh, you can also specify the Python environment by giving it its Python path here. Um, so this, this should be the same as if you go through the global.options dialog. Uh, if you've had problems so far, uh, it might be because you had a previous Python installation um, and it's not, and it might be getting confused over which one to use. Um, so you might have to reinstall things. Hopefully that's not the case. All right. Um, I'm just going to check really quick to make sure. All right. Looks like we don't have any questions in the chat, but I will um, pause just for a little bit longer. Addison, what's the error? So the um yeah yeah uh, you have to do the um uh library reticulate first yeah. for that to show up. And it's kind of like a chicken and egg thing. Um, the other code that I had in there um, of giving it a path, did I delete that? I might have deleted it, um, can sometimes also help as well. Um, if you get like an install zero, it's just, I think it's a bad internet connection and you have to just try it a few times. Um, All right. <laughs> so this is this is the hardest part. If we can get it past the install issues, that's the hardest part. Um, all right. So assuming that we've gotten pandas imported, I'm going to keep moving on so that we can um, stay on track, sort of. Um, so again, we imported pandas as PD. Let's do some math. So in order to do math, we're going to import math. Um, we're not giving it an alias, so we have to use four letters, math, for every function. So math dot is the package, and then after the period or the dot is the function that we want to do. Um, so let's import math, uh, command enter, control enter. Now let's do the square root of two. SQRT is for square root. Uh, what do you think this next line is saying? Sorry, zoomed in and it really jumped around. Math.cos. Cosine. Uh, Math.py. So 3.14, blah, blah, blah. We can just run, we can get the value of pi by running that part. Um, or not. Um, run the whole thing, we get negative one. 
just want to open close parenthesis, Addison. Oh, there we go. I just didn't like it when I had it highlighted. Okay. Um, and then, so the cosine of pi uh, factorial. Uh, so if you don't remember what factorials are, it's four times three times two times one. That's 24. Um, we've got a complicated function here where we're chaining together a lot of things. So we're taking pi, dividing it by four, getting the cosine of that, raising that to the power of two. Then we're adding um, the pi divided by four sine of that to the power of two. What was that formula? Does anybody recognize that formula if you've taken calculus? Um, it's a radius of a circle. All right. Uh, I forgot to... Um, uh, Devin Goodwin graduated last spring, and he was the one that really helped with um, porting over the tutorial to Python, and he got his master's in math, and so I'm, I'm thinking that he came up with that example of a complicated formula from his math background. All right. The next part, we're going to create some objects. So we've already done this. We created X, Y, and Z. Yes. Um, so anytime you train any package, does it always give you that model about that attribute format then? Yep. And anytime it's a base Python thing, you don't need that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Most of the time, it, there's not there's not a lot of base. Right. You have to you have to really specify where it's coming from. Um. Okay, so creating objects, we've already created X, Y, and Z. Let's talk about what we're doing here. Um, so when we assign values to an object in Python, we use the equal sign. Again, if you're not familiar with R, I apologize, but um, I do want to make some connections here. In R, generally, we use what we call an assignment arrow, which looks like this, um, but that does not work in Python. So we always use equal signs. And if we run this particular line of code, um, then we would see that the value of X in our environment changes from seven to six. And uh, we should be able to see the entire value because it's a scalar. Um, Python didn't, Python 2 was not case sensitive, if I remember right. Um, Python 3 is case sensitive, which is probably good because that um, way you have to be a little bit more careful about things. Um, so we want to make sure that you just pay attention, use autocomplete whenever possible um, so that you're using the um, right version. Is this that true? Did Devin write that right? Is it still case sensitive? Let's test it out. Let's see if we type in X, we get nothing out. If we type in lowercase X, we get six. So yes, Python 3 is case sensitive. <laughs> you used to be, a slop, be able to be sloppy in Python 2 and no longer allowed to do that. There's lots of coding guides out there for Python. And so we strongly recommend that you try to write clean code, right, so that you can read it, so that other people can read it. You never know when you're going to write some code, put it away for a few months, and then have to come back and, and read it again. Um, try to use um, object names and functions, um, or uh, generally object names should be nouns, function names should be verbs. Try not to reuse function names that have already been used. Um, 
Although with Python, because you have to specify a package, if you reuse a function name and it's not from a particular package, then it will use your version of the function that you created. You could create your own way of summing variables or summing values, and it would use your version because it's locally and not from a particular package. Google has a style guide that you could use. Um, and there's also a package PyLint that will automatically check and correct for issues in your code styling. Um, I've also heard, but I have not used, that ChatGPT is really good at reading and correcting code. And so you could also ask ChatGPT to fix your code. Um, all right. So if we create an object, but don't tell it to print an object or ask what it is, it won't do anything. Um, so if we just said X is six, we just see the code X is six. If we want to get the value out, we'd either type an X or we could say print X and it will print the six. Sometimes we need the print and sometimes we don't. Um, so if you try to print out a value and you can't get it, then just try putting print the function print around it. Once we create an object, we can use it. So we can do math with our value of X. So we could do 2.2 times X and we get 13.2. Notice that it um, really wants it to be a double. So it gives it lots of zeros and a one at the end, um, even though uh, we would normally just think of it as 13.2. If we take four plus X, that is an integer plus an integer. So we get an integer back. We can overwrite a value of an object. So we could take um, our value of X, add six, store that in Y. Then we could change the value of X. So Y is X plus six. Um, six plus six is 12. We see that over here in our uh, environment. Um, now we can change the value of X. Value of X is now two, but is the value of y 12 or 8? It's 12. We haven't overwritten y. Okay. Top to bottom, it's just a quick check. I know it seems like we're, it's a trick question, um, but just make sure that you know that if you change the value of x, y doesn't automatically change until you tell it to change or you run that code. So we can also print y or just say why, or we can look over in the environment. All right, so we should be able to do some, use Python as a calculator, create some objects, do a little bit of math with the objects. Everybody good there? If you have a working system, assuming. Okay. Let's talk about data types a little bit. We, I basically, uh, briefly mentioned integers and doubles. We have more than that. We have lists. Um, so a vector in Python, we formally call it a list, or it could be a NumPy array, and that's the basic data type. Um, and so a vector is a series of values, which can either be numbers or characters, but every entry of the vector has to be the same data type. Uh, and Python can tell that you're building a vector when you use square brackets, separating each element with a comma. Um, you can use a list function, or you can use NumPy. Again, that's the package. Array is the function. And then parentheses and square brackets will create a NumPy array. And they will concatenate a series of entries together. So um, if we need to install NumPy in um, the command window, um, let's see, this might... You should already have NumPy installed. I'm gonna just try to import NumPy. If you install Miniconda, you should be able to go import NumPy as NP. Oh, great, that worked. Okay, so because if you did Miniconda install, then you should get NumPy for free. If you 
don't, don't have it, if this import does not work, then you can use a pip command or you can, and that keeps it in the Python world, or you can go back and use the pi underscore install from the R world, and that will work as well. Okay. The um, exclamation point at the beginning of pip tells it that it is a shell command rather than a Python command. And um, so that is for interacting with the operating system or the software application rather than interacting with Python. And um, in the shell environment, you can type commands and execute them by pressing the enter key. And then the shell interprets the command, executes it, displays the output or in the terminal window. All right. So I already imported NumPy as NP. Um, a lot of packages have a default alias that most people commonly use. But again, uh, you can make the alias be whatever you want it to be. Um, ideally, it's something that's shorter than the actual package name. So let's create a base um, array in Python. So this is uh, a list of temperatures. This is going to be a Python uh, list because it's just the square brackets. And um, we created that list. It's over in our environment. We can see some of the values. Let's get that in the console. So I'm going to do control enter in the console and it prints out all four values. You could do the same thing as a NumPy array. So again, we imported NumPy as NP period array uh, is the function that we want the same list of values in square brackets but also inside the parentheses and now we have two objects in our environment we've got the temps list we created the second one temps underscore numpy and we can see that the difference is that we've got one that's identified as an array in one is just the list. Even though it has the same values in it, and we can also print um, the NumPy array. If we do print temps NumPy, you don't see the array function out front. It just see the list. Notice so there's no commas in between the numbers. You just see the spaces there. So that's the difference between a base list and a NumPy array. Um, and how they're handled will be slightly different. Okay. So those are numbers, integers. Uh, we can create a list of words or character strings. Um, character strings can be anything. It could be just single letters. Um, it's nice to actually have words that we can recognize. So here we've got a list of animals. Um, and let's build that list and print it out. Notice how it took the double quotes and made them single quotes. Double quote and single quote are used interchangeably. Um, if you needed to have a character string that had it a quote had a quote in it, then you can alternate which ones you use. Um, the outer ones are going to be what um, classifies a single string as a unit. Okay. We do the same thing in NumPy. And again, we get the same list out, but this time we have it space separated instead of comma separated. So once we have lists, um, we can check to see what type it is. If we created the list, we should know what the list type is, but maybe we um, have a list that somebody else created and we need to check the type of it. So the um, type function is a base function and so the tight open parenthesis, temps list, close parenthesis. And if we run that, we'll see that it's a list type. What do you think will happen if we do the same thing for NumPy, temps NumPy? Let's give it a try. It says it's a NumPy ND array.
So an ND array is a Python class that represents an n-dimensional array or a multi-dimensional array so that we could have more than one dimension in that array. An array is a data structure that stores a collection of values of the same type. So in this case, they'd have to all be um, integers or all be numbers. All right, let's create a vector. We'll call it DEC that contains decimal value numbers and then check what data type that vector contains. We already have this here. Um, we've got some examples there. Uh, I want you to just run it. And then um, I will give you a few um, seconds to run that and then I will run it myself. So I want you to get, get ahead a little bit if you're able to, if you've got a working system. All right, I'm just gonna run all of this all at once by using the play button. I'm gonna scroll down and I'll be able to see the output. So first we created a NumPy array. So it says ND array. And then um, the last set is just a Python list. Get the same values, they just look slightly different. One thing I love about Python that I don't really have a good equivalent in R is a dictionary. So the idea of a dictionary is that you have a key value pair. So when you when if you take a dictionary and you look up a word, a word could have multiple definitions associated with that same word. It's got a pronunciation. It tells you maybe where the origin is. It tells you a lot of information about the word. Um, and so that's the word in the dictionary is the key, and then the value pair is all the information that's associated with that particular word. In this particular case, we have a one to one dictionary where we've got a key that has just a single translation. Um, uh, Devin was also multilingual in English and Spanish, and so he created a uh, Spanish dictionary, so a literal dictionary for the dictionary type. Um, and so here, um, hello, we can translate that to hola, uh, how are you, como esta, and I, um, fibula is peron, um, if I'm pronouncing that right. So if we run, I'm going to build, actually do this line by line, I'm going to build my translate dictionary. And then I'm going to translate Fibia. So how do we do that? So translate is built as a dictionary. In our environment, we can see that we've got curly braces. Um, and it gives us a little bit of a preview. It gives us the key and the value. And if we want to use it, we put in the key in quotes in the, in the square bracket, and that should give us the value of fibula. If we had um, multiple definitions for fibula, um, then it would give us all of the values associated with that particular key. Uh, the nice thing about dictionaries is that they don't have to all be of the same type. Um, and so the different values can be um, different types. So vectors are ordered, dictionaries are not. Um, so even though a physical dictionary is in alphabetical order, the dictionary type doesn't have to be in alphabetical order. Um, vectors are indexed by integer positions, uh, dictionaries are indexed by keys, and all the elements in a vector are the same type, while in dictionaries that doesn't have to be the case. Uh, you can change or mutate the values contained in a vector or a dictionary, but you cannot change the value of the keys in the dictionary once they're assigned. So keys are immutable. Uh, so let's... Um, do a few more examples. We could create a vector. Uh, we'll call it VEC, V-E-C, just the numbers one through four. 
we can access the values in a vector by index. So the uh, Python is zero based. And so the first value in, or the first index is zero. Um, R is one base, so the first index in R is one. Um, we've got a graphic here that we'll show in just a little bit. But if we want the first value out of that vector, we say print vec zero, and we need to scroll and we get the value down there. Again, we can create a dictionary using curly braces, which identifies it as a dictionary. The first uh, word is the key. The colon identifies it as a pair, and then the value is after the colon. We can get values in the dictionary by putting in the key, and the key does not have to be a single um, string. It can have spaces in it. And we can add a new key value pair to a dictionary. Um, the translate is the dictionary's name. Inside the square brackets is the new key equals and the new value. So we said, I like cheese. Uh, me gusta el queso. Um, again, again, excuse my pronunciation. We can get that translation out by printing it. And we see that down there. We can modify the value in a dictionary. We can change hello to adios if we wanted to um, really make a confused dictionary. And if we print, uh, try to get the value of hello out, now we see adios where before we would have said hola. We can get the whole dictionary. If this was an actual dictionary, you know, really big, we wouldn't want to print the whole dictionary. This is small, so we can actually do that. There are other types, including logicals, so true, false, Boolean values. Um, Python is case sensitive. R wants true and false to be completely capitalized. Python only wants the first letter to be capitalized. So this is one of those times where if you go back and forth between Python and R, you're gonna have to make sure that you're using the right casing um, so that you don't, um, it'll give you an error. And then hopefully that will remind you that Python and R are similar but different in important ways. Um, we'll take a little break here in just a few minutes, but I wanna get through this section. So uh, true and false represent uh, particular numbers. Uh, what numbers do you think true and false represent? Zero and, one. Zero and one, which is which? One. Yes, true is one, good job. <laughs> so on or off, true is on one. False is off zero. And um, so we can coerce true and false into numbers if we wanted to do math with them. And so type already uh, of logic is telling us this is a list. We already knew that was a list. Uh, if we are wanting to know the type of each element in the logic, true or false, we could give it a particular element of that. So the first element of that list so logic square bracket zero, and then in, that's inside type in um, parentheses. And now it, it identifies true as a Boolean. So again, this is the index, it's not a value. If we try to mix and match false, a word, space, and uh, the value two, let's see what happens here. Uh, so this is a for loop that will go through this list, and for each item in the list, we'll print the type. So for i, that's the index, and diff types is our list. Colon tells it that's what we want to instructions to loop over. We're going to print the type of each item in the list. Oops, and we have to give it the whole thing. First one is false. 
uh, Boolean string integer. So it does, even though it, we're mixing and matching, it still can identify the individual type because it's just looking at that one particular element. Um, all right, before we start talking about tuples, uh, do you want to take a five minute break? And if you're still having install issues, uh, we can maybe try to work on them a little bit more. Um, then we'll wrap up types of objects and get into importing data and working with data frames. Okay. So let's do um, maybe 408, come back. Uh, I'm going to mute myself in case I have side conversations. Um, remind me to unmute.
All right, we'll get started here in just a second, um, letting people in the room get settled in. All right, um, are you guys okay with me going on? Yeah, okay. Uh, all right, uh, anything online, Sarah? Uh, no. Okay. So there's another type that Python has that is unique to Python. Um, there's no R equivalent as far as I'm aware, um, and that is a tuple. Um, and tuples cannot be modified once you create them. Uh, and they can contain um, elements of different types, including numbers, strings, and other objects. Um, you define tuples like parentheses. Um, so normally parentheses are used for functions, uh, but we don't, it's a function without a name. And so if you just have uh, open close parentheses with some items inside the parentheses, that's you're defining a tuple. So if we run this line of code here, uh, over in our environment, we'll now see our tuple uh, listed here. And if we click on it, um, we can actually get in for a, a preview, or we can click on anything in this environment and we'll get a preview of what's in there um, in another tab in this um, source code area. Oh, notice if we do that, it does identify it as a tuple. Okay. All right. I resize it. Things jump around a little bit. Scroll back. Uh, then um, we can access items in a tuple. So if we have um, tuple uh, underscore ex, for example, square bracket zero, square bracket. Um, and uh, we say equals four. What do you think is going to happen here? Nothing. Why? You can't change tuples. Yes. So tu tuples are immutable. So it just complains and yells at you. Um, does not support item assignment. Okay. Uh, let's see what happens when we try to mix different data types into one vector. So again, tuples, we can have multiple data types. What happens when we try to do that in a list or a vector? Uh, we can, um, let's uncomment this for loop here. So I'm doing control shift C and that uncomments. And I'm gonna have both lines selected so that I can run both of them. So for I, the item in our list, uh, vector numchar colon, we're going to print the type int 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 string. Okay, that's good. So that didn't coerce anything. And do the same thing for our logic. Um, some uh, we'll call this num logic one two three and false. The type of that is a list. And we get three integers and a bool, boolean. And do the same thing for char logic. I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna click on it. We can see a list and we see string, 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 bool. Okay. Uh, if we have one, two, three, and then four in quotes. It sees the quotes and even though four is a number, it treats it as a string. Okay. If we're allowed to have multiple types in the same object, the hierarchy is integer, float, uh, bool, string, list, 
tuple, set, and dictionary. So dictionary is the biggest, and it can contain all of these that are below. If we were to make the Python R connection, um, a, in Python, an R list is equivalent to a dictionary, sort, sort of. Um, dictionary is a little bit more powerful, easier to use in Python. Um, in R, a Python list is equivalent to a vector. And we can also do lists of lists. So we could create three lists in Python. Um, different OS types, maybe some favorite numbers and some logic. Notice that they're all the same length. Then we can do a layered list by assigning inside the square brackets those three lists. If we put layered list square bracket one, we got out Remember zero-based indexing, so that means we got out the second list from the layered list. If we say layered list, square bracket zero, square bracket one, what does that do? The first list, which is OS, and the um, second object in the first list, which is one. So to access the elements of a list within a list, um, we use the syntax, the name of the list, the uh, outer structure, list I, and then the element is the second one in the square brackets. Um, we've been outputting values with print and by just running the name of the variable, we can do this because in a Jupyter notebook or interactive Python shell, such as RStudio, you can simply type the name of the variable or the expression to see the value printed. Um, but if you are running Python from a command line or in a different kind of interactive environment, you might need to use the print command to display the output. So ID, uh, RStudio is nice, Jupyter Notebook is nice because you can be a little bit more flexible without having to do print. Uh, to create a name list in Python, we can use dictionaries. Um, so again, this is going to be uh, a dictionary that has keys and values that are different links. So we'll have a name list, we'll give it a title, uh, is our key and our value is statistics. Our next key is numbers, and we're going to give it um, a value, a list from one to 11. We'll pay attention to that in just a second. And then we're going to give it another key, data, and give it a value of true. Let's run that. Control enter or command enter. And It, there was a carriage break return there that did not like that. So I had to remove the carriage return. Um, now we can print that. So list range one to 11 gave us the values one to 10. Why did it give us one to 10 instead of one to 11? Zero based, okay. Um, I know that in the computer science world, people really love zero base. Zero base to me is really annoying now that I've been using R for so long and not Python as much. Um, to me, you know, it's 11 items, um, one, two, you know, it's not even 11 items. Um, again, we've got a graphic here in just a little bit. So uh, it stops before you think it's gonna stop. Okay, let's import some data. I, uh, we can import data in the environment. Uh, this is going to import it uh, into R, okay? Um, but let's go ahead and we're gonna do that. So we're gonna do from text base. 
And in the zip file that you are given, um, we're going to get select the Blackfoot fish.csv and click open. And we're just going to use all the defaults and click import. And notice how that went into the R environment and not into Python. So how do we get it into Python? Uh, this code down here is how we would read it in to R. So this is the um, R code because it just has a single caret. We'll use that to help us import it into Python. So we need pandas installed if we haven't already gotten it, which everybody hopefully has. Um, let's go ahead and uh, make sure that we import it again. And now we're going to use pandas. We can do read underscore CSV to read a CSV file. We can just give it the name of the CSV file and it's going to look in the same folder that this RMD file is in. If the data is not in the same folder where you're working on your code, um, you can give it a whole path and it will um, import that way as well. So if we needed to specify the whole path, um, that will work, but also the, the shortcut of same directory um, makes for cleaner code. And um, we had it in our files right next to each other. Blackfoot fish is in the same folder as this intro um, RMD file. And so we can just import it. Now we're in Python. We can see that there's something different over here because we have blue circle with a white arrow in it. And we can see that it says data frame. And we can see a little bit of information about that data frame. We can get a preview of it by clicking on it and it'll create a tab. That did not look like it imported properly. I think it's just not previewing properly. Let's look at the structure of the data to make sure that it imported. Um, if for some reason you had problems getting the zip file, this uh, next code chunk would get you the, um, the actual file from GitHub. Let's look at the type of Blackfoot fish. Okay, it's a pandas data frame, so that's good. Um, we're a little bit concerned that it didn't import properly. So let's look at the shape. So blackfoot fish dot shape. So blackfoot fish is the data frame. The function we want to use is shape and we're going to print that. Okay, so this is looking better. I think that it's just not viewing properly. Um, and parentheses means what type is parentheses? Tuple, so we can't, this is immutable. We can't change this, okay? Um, we can't add more rows, we can't add more columns. Uh, and we can't change the values in there. Um, we can get the column number of columns out, which should be seven. Uh, this is the columns, uh, actually gives you the column names. So these are all the names of the columns, trip, mark, length, weight, year, section, and species. Um, so trip is the time that they went out to collect the fish. Mark, um, can't remember what that is, is probably if they mark the fish or not. Length, if they took the length, what the length is. Weight, year of the collection, section of the river, species of the fish. D types is the data types of each column in the first few rows. So trip is an integer, um, uh, mark is an integer, length and weight are floats, integer for year, section and species are objects, and the data type is an object. 
There is a nice function called describe that will describe all of the um, columns in the data frame. So let's see, we got count number of objects that should be the same for all of them uh, as long as we don't have any missing um, actually yep missing values it takes out so you see that we've got some missing values in weight mean standard deviation min 25th percentile 50th percentile um this is wrapping around oh 75th percentile and max You can also just check the type of the blackfoot fish. And again, we get data, um, data frame. Some other functions that you can use to inspect data frames, um, data set name and shape is the rows and columns. Uh, shape in square bracket zero is the number of rows. Shape in square brackets one is the number of columns. Uh, the length of the data set name variable gives you the number of columns as well. Um, we can look at the content head, open close parentheses, the first five rows. Um, tail is the last five rows. Call names is the column names. Data set name index is the row names. We can get summary of the content using info or describe. So a data frame is a two-dimensional table-like data structure similar to a spreadsheet in Excel. Um, it's a primary data structure provided by the Pandas library, and you can create a data frame in several ways, such as loading data from a CSV, Excel file, SQL database, or constructing it from scratch. Um, using Python lists or dictionaries, data frame is made up of columns, where each column is a series object. Each column can have a different data type, all the values in a column must have the same data type. And um, we've touched on this a little bit, but we're going to touch on it a little bit more because it's important. We're going to extract some data from our data frame. Before we do that, any questions on importing data or looking at the data frame? Uh, we've already read our CSV, but if we hadn't, we could read it. Um, this is actually, we're going to read it in as DF just to give it a shorter name. So I'm going to rerun this again, or run it with a shorter name. Uh, we can access the weight column by saying DF square brackets and weight in single quotes. And we're going to name that weight column so that we have a separate copy of that. Um, if we print the weight column, oh, thank goodness, it didn't print all 18,000 rows. What did it do? Printed the first five and the last five. Did give us the length and the type of it. That could have been dangerous. Looks like I need to um, remove some stuff from the um, document here. Um, we can get the years out. If we say years.head without parentheses, it should um, not really work. Okay. Gave us the head and the tail. Let's see what happens if we do open close parentheses. Now we actually just get the first five. Um, without the open close parenthesis, it just summarized the entire object. Um, we need to actually have the open and close parenthesis in order to uh, for the function to work. We can get the structure of the years, STRs for structure. No, sorry. STR converts years into strings. So let's look at. Um, no, that's not that's not it either. Okay. Uh, so um, 
STR is just a different way of looking at um, the years. It's still storing it as integers. Uh, if we wanted to get into a particular data frame or um, vector by giving it an index, we need to use a function, pandas function called iloc for index location. And let's see here, if you look over in the environment tab here, we can see if I can get back up here. This in the same place. So our studio tells you the dimensions of Blackfoot fish. Um, so we can roughly view the data set as a matrix of entries with variable names for each columns. We can use the iLook function to perform the same task that we did before, but using the following code. So if we wanted um, the values in the fifth column and store them in a variable called years, we could say colon for all the rows, comma, remember fifth column is a value of four. And then if we want the values, we'll do period values. And we'll get years out as an array now. So let's get something smaller for practice. We're gonna create a data frame from scratch. Um, we're overriding the Blackfoot fish DF as um, this new data frame. So we have to be careful about reusing names. Um, and I'm actually gonna call this DF2 so that we're careful about that. So we've got X is a vector that has H, N, T, W, V. Y is May, October, March, August, February, and then Z is some years. And DF2 prints it out. So what would be output if we entered df.iloc square bracket two comma colon. And I have a code, empty code chunk here for you to type that in, df. I L O C square bracket two comma colon. Oops, DF two. What did we get here? The third row, yes. Um, and it prints out the column names as well as the values. How would we get a value uh, or output of 2015? We want 2015. Let's see, that is in row one. Okay. So, the second row, the index of one, we could get just get the whole row out. Let me make sure I change this to DF2. But we want just that last item. Um, so we could say, instead of colon, we could say two. Uh, another way to do it, we can do first row and this um, third object in that row. Let's see. Yep, that works as well. Let's say we don't know the location of a particular thing. So let's say we want to look for in our data frame in the Y column. Let's look for where it equals October, and we want out um, the Z column, and let's see what this code does. Okay, so we're looking for when Y is October. 
then look in the Z column and tell us what that value is and it tells us 2015. So that's kind of complicated. Another way, so this is actually a fourth way, uh, give it the name of the column Z and the second item in that column. Oops, the F2. There we go, 2015. Okay. So loc is, you give it a name, a named column or a named row. I loc, you give it an index. So I for index. So I wanna to go to these pictures here. So if we want to index and get a specific element, let's say we have a list of grades we want out 93, we wanna get 93 out, we give it two in the square brackets. That's the specific one that we want. So grades two says 93. If we want a range of elements, the zero based indexing, zero starts before the first element and the commas are essentially what it's counting, okay? So zero to one would only give us 88. Zero to two would give us 88 and 72. If we want 72 and 93, we have to say grades one to three, and we say um, the symbol for two is the colon. So one to three gives us 72 and 93. So think about when we're slicing or we're getting out a range of elements in zero-based indexing, think of it as indexing on the commas. So it's in between the values. If we want the first uh, object in a list, zero in square brackets or zero to one would give you the same thing. Um, zero comma one would give you the first two objects in a list, uh, but they're adjacent. So you could also do A plus B, the second position that you want plus one, you have to add one. So one comma three would give the same items as um, well, if, if you were wanting to go from one to three, um, one and three, you would actually not get the same items here. So um, I need to check, fix that. So let's check um, this. So we've got a list of five values, one through five. Um, and we're specifying each item in the list. So we see one through five. If we want the same list, but we wanna give it a range, again, we have to go one more than what we want. So one to six. If we wanna go backwards, we can start from six and go to one, but we have to tell it that we wanna step by negative one. So the last thing in this range is the step by. So we're stepping backwards by one, but notice we start at six and we don't get all the way down to one. Uh, range 123 to 131 goes from 123 but stops at 130. Uh, 3 to negative 1 by negative 1 should be the values 3, 2, 1, and 0. Now, if we want to index into those lists, if we do one, uh, the list is 1 through 5, one colon three should give us two and three. Uh, in the list range 123 to 131, three to six gives us 126, 127, and 128. If our list is the range six to one by negative one, two to four will give us four and three. 
So if you have adjacent items, the colon notation is nicer, as long as you remember that you have to add one more one than you might think that you need. Um, if you have non adjacent items, then listing everything out is the way that you're um, going to go. So 1, 3, and 9 would give you the first, uh, second, fourth, and tenth items in a list. First, third, and ninth if you're thinking zero base. Uh, so we can use this uh, in iLOC to get out information. So I'm going to change this to DF2. So iLOC indexing location, square bracket one comma two, comma, no colon. So you can either have the colon there to get all columns or not have the colon, it'll still work. That gets us the second and third rows or rows identified by one and two. Um, if we use a colon, since one and two are adjacent, that gets you the same thing. You can look at them both by playing and we'll see them one on top of each other. If we want non-adjacent items, again, we have to specify them explicitly with a one comma three. And we change it to F2. So you could do this with names instead of indices. Um, if we change this to DF2, how do we pull off only columns X and Y or X and Z? So X and Y are the first and the second columns. So we could do zero comma one, or we could say with the names X and Z. If we do X and Z, then we don't have iloc, we use just loc. All right. So, um, does everybody feel fairly comfortable about accessing things out of vectors? I kind of probably want to go a little bit faster so we can get some plotting in. All right. Um, if uh, really quick before we do that, um, in R, there's a, a big deal about making sure that you know what data type things are, changing data type. Um, and with Python, um, we don't have to worry so much about um, characters um, being called factors. Uh, in this Blackfoot fish data set, um, species is um, takes on values of rainbow trout, west slope cutthroat trout, bull trout, and brown trout. Um, if we get the unique values out, we can just see um, those levels. And we can do the same thing for the species uh, or without the parentheses. If we do right without the parentheses, again, that doesn't really do anything. Um, it just gives us the header and the footer of the frame essentially the same thing as not having unique there at all, because you need to have the open close parentheses. Um, we can convert a year to a category type. This is similar to converting it to character or a factor. Uh, and so we're gonna put an F at the end if we wanna treat it categorically. Uh, we can also use pandas to do that, and the function there is categorical instead of as type category. And when we do that, we can see that it's 10 categories, but they're integers categories um, from 1989 to 2006. If you were able to get SciPy in, um, which didn't install for me, um, let me see if I can get this really quick. Uh, 
uh, while that's running, um, we're going to, from SciPy, we're going to, um, this is particular notation. So instead of importing everything in the SciPy module, we're only going to import the stats module and we're going to import it as stats. Um, since we're not changing the alias, we could just skip that as stats part and just import stats. And we're going to make sure that we have NumPy imported. Notice how we can give, um, do assignment of two variables at the same time using a comma. So we want a value of mu and a value of sigma. There's two separate things. We're separating it with a comma. We say equals zero comma one, no square brackets. And it magically puts one in for sigma and zero in for mu. Uh, we can get a, a, from the stats package, we can look at a normal distribution and get random values or random numbers. The center is mu, the scale is sigma, and we want a thousand um, samples. And from that, we can look at numpy mean of the samples, should be something close to zero. It's over here, it's 0 0.06. And the standard deviation should be something close to one and it is 0 0.985. Um, we can print a string together, the F paste things together. The mean is in um, curly braces mean so that will look up the value of the mean and the standard deviation is curly braces standard deviation. And we probably should round those, but um, we can get something that looks kind of ugly, but prints it all out together. All right, I wanna get to plotting. Finding help, there's lots of help out there for Python. Um, And I'm going to skip finding means, talking about masking. You can go through that yourself. Cleaning data, pay attention to missing values. Let's do some data visualization. I'm going to have to run pip install really quick, probably. Told everybody to come prepared and my computer decided that it wasn't going to be prepared today. All right, that wasn't too bad. Doing it the other way definitely took longer. Okay, I'm gonna import from matplotlib pyplot as just plt for plot. And let's get a scatter plot. So it's a scatter uh, pie plot, blackfoot fish clean. Um, I'm going to just run this really quick. It's dropping the NAs. Weight, um, and then comma, blackfoot fish clean length. Let's see what happens there. And we need to do plot.show. So it plotted one thing on the x-axis and one thing on the y-axis, but oh my goodness, we don't know which one it is. Um, so let's clean this up a little bit and put some labels on there. Uh, we're going to, um, the axis, or so um, we're gonna import matplotlib pyplot as plot. Fig x is going to create a new figure and an axis object that we're going to add things to. Do these one at a time. Um, on the scatter plot for the axis on the scatter plot, um, 
we're going to have um, blackfoot fish clean weight and blackfoot fish clean length. We're going to set the X label to be weight. So it's plotting X comma Y. So I set the X axis, set the Y axis label, set the ticks. We're going to give it and rotate the ticks by 90 degrees on the Y axis, set a title. And now we're going to show it. You can show this after each step if you wanted to check your work. And we can get um, expand this, show in a new window. Hopefully those of you that are watching online can see this in the new window. Um, but it just enlarges this. Sometimes if it doesn't show properly, I will minimize it and then expand it again. And we might get more of the axis if it doesn't show up properly. Uh, really quick, let's just do um, side by side blocks plots. So I'm going to scroll down to side by side blocks plots. I'm just going to play the whole thing. And so we can get box plots of fish weight by species. And if you wanted to, you could go through the code there to see how it did it. Um, but the function is just box plot. All right. Sorry that we kind of um, rushing at the end here. Um, hopefully you're able to explore more on your own. Again, the idea here is just to give you a taste of how to get started and maybe get through some of the install hurdles. I know that we weren't able to solve everybody's install issues here. Um, we will um, we're, uh, add on a um, next step Python in the spring. Uh, and then we also have our other R series workshops. Um, Sarah, do you wanna give the closing yeah. spiel? Yeah, it, so I guess there's a few things to know. One is that we recorded today's workshop, so I'll post it shortly in a few days. Um, and then we have other R workshops recorded online. It's montana.edu slash data science. There's um, training materials there and our work, our um, videos are there.